Yesterday on the Locked On NBA Big Board podcast, Leith Tulane dropped off his top 10 prospects for the 2023 NBA draft. And in this episode, we are going to round out the first round or his top 30. Stay tuned to see what surprises we have. And of course, Leaf is going to explain why there are some guys that he is higher or lower on than the consensus. And Leaf is one of the best in the business. So looking forward to this episode. Stay tuned. Big, big shout out to each and every person that has made the Locked On NBA Big Board podcast your first listen of the day. I'm your host, Rafael Barlow, the director of scouting for NBA Big Board, the founder of NBA Draft Junkies, and I am now the new director of scouting for the NTX Combine, which is a combine for draft eligible seniors. I guess that's the word I'm looking for, draft eligible seniors looking to perform in front of NBA scouts, so you'll be hearing um, a little bit about that in the in the next few few days or even weeks. But my co-host for today is Leaf Tulane. Leaf was on yesterday, dropped off his top 10. Our top 10s are very, very similar. And I'm starting to notice that me and Leaf, we kind of think alike. Like a lot of our thoughts and um, you know, just how we evaluate and how we see prospects is similar. And uh, I just respect it so much. Not because ours are similar, it's just Leaf thinks outside the box too. He's not going with the consensus. And he can also really explain why he feels certain way, certain ways about about players. So looking forward to this episode. The Jazz played tonight. And uh, you know, my my two teams, I guess I'm a Blazers fan, but I live in Dallas. Tough loss in Dallas. And the Blazers are just Full win Benyama mode. And then Utah play. I honestly did they win tonight? Yeah, they beat the Spurs tonight. So how do you how do you feel about that? Is it like <laughs> are are uh, you upset? Are, is, it, is it true that they shut down Clarkson and Sexton for the season? Uh it's not official. I uh, I, I can say with certainty I've been watching Sexton warm up. Um he's wearing a heavy kind of padded heat kind of almost looks like it's heat uh heated leg sleeve for his hamstring um and he's been having issues with his hamstring uh all season he's had two different stints where he's been out and then Clarkson's got a dislocated finger so uh whether you can say it's shut down and strategic I, they're legitimate injuries in this case um the fact that they're winning I think is a testament to the coaching and it's building culture. So there's part of me that's happy to see them really fighting because I've, I'm not a huge believer in tanking. Um, that said, I, I would like to get a higher pick. Um, just the fan of me knows the real, the realistic thing is the higher the pick, the better chance you get a guy who can change your franchise's trajectory. Yep. And the jazz are already heading in the right direction um, and they could further add to it. And I think you can further add even better if you're higher up. So to answer that uh, not very succinctly, I'm I'm indifferent on the win, um, but it is what it is. I'm happy to see the Jazz players improving. Yeah, I mean, I, I, the feeling in Dallas is a little weird because I think people are going to be extremely disappointed if they don't at least make the play in. But now people are like, okay, if we're bad enough and it's top 10 protected, we can keep our pick. And then I've seen some people say, well, maybe – we can win the lottery. I think the chances are like 1.5 or something like that if Dallas kept their pick to to get Wimbayama. But as a Blazers fan, I'm like, okay, it's it's a it's a possibility that Portland could could really move up. All right, let's talk about your your big board, and I'll just go down the the list. You had Victor Wimbayama number one, Scoot Henderson number two, Brandon Miller number three, Amin Thompson number four, Asar Thompson. Is this your yeah? Asar Thompson number five. Cam Whitmore, number six. Jairus Walker, seven. Gigi Jackson, number eight. Kaysen Wallace, nine. Anthony Black at number 10. So who is numero 11? I mean, you like how I did that combination of Spanish and English there. Uh, it's the Anthony Black's Razorback teammate, Nick Smith Jr. Uh, he's someone that I've, I've had a tough time evaluating, and I'm going to need to go back and watch more film on him. Uh, he, he's got it. Uh, 
the ability to score. You you can tell. You you can tell that's how he's wired. He's able to score. But there's there's a level of inefficiency and uh, inconsistency because sometimes he's excellent and sometimes he's not. And uh, he's also dealt with injury. And how much has that factored into the play? How much does that factor mm-hmm. into his evaluation for the future? Can he avoid injuries, especially on knees with a guard? That that concerns me. Uh, so my logic on him, why I've got him this high, but also lower than some people may have him, which I know some people really like him. Uh, the reason to like him is, is shot making. Uh, he's, he only shot 34%, 74% from the line, 12 and a half points, but he's capable of making a lot of shots and he's capable of running the point guard while being a score. He's a true combo card. So that that's my logic for why I like him. The reason I'm a little concerned is I, I think he's a guy who can get to spots but he's not able to really put serious pressure on the rim. And I don't think he's that great of a shooter to make that like you kind of have to be that good of a shooter to override the inability to put pressure on the rim. And I don't think he's that good of a passer to make the other way of overriding that inefficiency by being reliant on di- difficult touch oriented shots. So uh, I would say I'm probably lower than, than the consensus, but um, that that's my kind of read on Nick Smith Jr. It's a tough read because you have to factor in the injuries. He was a little rusty. He was in and out of the lineup. He did show some flashes of what he's capable of doing. He shot 48% on catch and shoot jumpers, which is really good when, when he was um, you know, getting looks off the catch. The biggest concern for me is when I watched his film coming into the season, I knew he could score. I had a chance to watch him live. His bread and butter was his touch and floaters like my knock on him was he didn't get all the way to the rim which you know he has a a thin frame so one hand he's kind of avoiding you know the punishment by not going all the way to the rim but his floater was just it was just his bread and butter that was his go-to and he didn't make floaters at a high clip this season I want to say it was like 30 he shot like 30 percent on floaters or something like that which was really surprising and just his overall touch was up and down. Like like I said, he shot 48% on catch-and-shoot jumpers, but he only shot 73% at the line, and I want to say 30% on, on floaters. So I'm like, what is the real indicator of his touch? I do think that he is a better shooter than the numbers showed, but my concern is what position is he? Is he a one? Is he a two? And then I've also heard some people tell me they don't know if he's really six five and so we'll, we'll see how he measures out at the i don't line. think he's six five i i've never seen him in person um but you see him stand next to devo davis on his team who i i perceive to be about six four and they they seem to look eye to eye and i i'm not sold of that and that's the other thing uh i'm glad you brought that up and not to cut you off that that's one concern i seriously have is you if to play in today's NBA where guards are bigger and bigs are smaller, if you're gonna be a two guard and not able to play the point, if he's six foot four and he's not a superior athlete, and by superior athlete I can uh I'd think of a guy like Anthony Black, I'd ca- classify his team as a superior athlete. And even even so, that's mostly because he's bigger at the guard position. Uh, it's really, really hard to play in the NBA and have that scoring role unless you're just unbelievably skilled. And the fact that his touch was spotty is makes me a little lower. And, and I would say there's a chance he moves on my board, but I think it's more likely to be in a negative direction than a positive for me. Interesting. All right. Number 12. Who do you have at number 12? This might be a bit of a shock. I've got City Sissoko at number 12. I like it. I like City. I like what he's done this year as far as improving in his aggression and assertiveness. And I've I've tweeted about it. When I watched him in the past, especially when he was in Spain last year, he settled for a lot of step back jumpers when he had a ball screen. And even earlier in the year. But as the season went on, he was coming down the lane and he was dunking in traffic. So I like City. What what are your reasons for for liking Sissoko? I think he's a phenomenal athlete. He could be classified as the superior athlete I was just talking about. Uh, I think I mentioned this yesterday when we talked about the G League and why I'm higher than on Scoot Henderson, uh, despite some shooting struggles than than some people. 
uh, it, it's the same logic. I think that league percentages and counting stats, I don't factor in as much. I just have to trust my eyes. And when I watch him play, his shot looks okay. Results are, aren't are great. And I buy that he can improve that. I like the fact he's kind of knowing who he is. And like you mentioned, he's been a more of a downhill attacker recently. Uh, there's been a couple games where he's been downhill attacking and distributing as well as scoring. That really impressed me. I recently watched a game he played against the Memphis Hustle, um, and he yeah. had he had 24 game. points, six uh, six boards, four assists. He he's just doing it all. And there's a stretch where he had in, in including that game he had 23 against the Hustle, 24 against the Hustle, 22 and 22 against the Wolves, and then 20 against Go Go in five straight games. And his assists kind of all spanned around four to six, and. I, and I know that's sheer production. I just said I don't really factor that in. The fact that he was able to do that in the positive side, exceeding the expectations, really was impressive. And then defensively, I think he can be a terror. I think he can be an amazing defender in the NBA because of his length, instincts, and athleticism. And strength. And yeah, strength. Yeah, and, yeah, and he's yeah. built. Yeah. Like the, the the stats say he's 176 on Tankathon. I just looked it up and no, that, that is not no, right. That's not right at all. Yeah, he was 176 in like 2018, probably. All right, when we return, we'll talk about number 13 and, and so on. I've always thought I could be a great NBA GM, and it turns out that it's not that easy, but it turns out that there is an opportunity that I can be in a game. And if you've ever had the same thought about – being an NBA GM and managing your own basketball franchise, well, now you can do it at the Ultimate Pro Basketball GM, and you can do it right now. The game allows you to manage every strategic aspect of a franchise from playing through seasons and leading your franchise and your fans to glory as you build a historic dynasty. In the simulation, you are responsible for dealing with the challenging personalities from the coaches and the players, from hiring the coaches and the assistants, training and trading players, making draft picks, and navigating your franchise through free agency and the draft and all the ups and downs in multiple seasons. All of this in a challenging and realistic game world, the Ultimate Pro Basketball GM is completely free. It is playable offline. You can go play on the go, and you can play when you want to. So you, as a Locked On listener, you will get a 100% free boost for your franchise when you are using the promo code Locked On in the game store. So make sure you check it out. To download the game, just visit probasketballgm.com, scan the code, or look it up on the app stores. That is probasketballgm.com, the ultimate basketball GM. So start your dynasty today. All right, second segment, we only got two, 11, and 12. All right, who's number 13 on your, your big board? Number 13 for me is a guy that I could see – moving up and I think he's become more of a draft darling than anyone. And that's Taylor Hendricks from UCF yep. uh, from relative anonymity to the lottery. And he's a guy that fits modern NBA basketball beautifully uh, stretch four with some defensive chops and a beautiful jump shot from UCF. I, I think that there's not a team in the NBA that wouldn't want him to be on the team. The question is, What's his ceiling as opposed to the floor? Because the floor is mighty high. The ceiling, I think there's questions of how good he can be, but I don't think anyone's going to doubt the fact that he can contribute to winning basketball. Yeah, I think he has a high ceiling simply because I think there's still a lot of room for him to grow, especially as like a a ball handler and maybe a shot creator, like maybe like someone that can face up and attack. The shooting is good, 39% from three. I think it was like 1.7 blocks per game. It's a lot to like. Like you said, the floor is high, but I think if he adds a little bit of face-up and, and and ball handling and being able to attack closeouts, and I thought his passing was good. I saw some report where they they said that the passing was like one of his biggest weaknesses, but I, I saw him make some pretty decent reads. So I, I think that the passing and being able to do a little bit more off the dribble could um, – could could play a big role in in him maximizing his his potential. I have him in the top ten, and I I think that he's going to shine in the pre draft workout process. Right? That I I could see happening. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. So fourteen. Fourteen. Fourteen for me is Derek Whitehead. Uh, he's a guy that similar to Nick Smith was a highly regarded recruit, struggled with injury, and then struggled struggled on the floor. And then showed flashes, and you have to kind of 
kind of look search through the tea leaves and and buy flashes if you're going to be high on them and or it's easier to be low and and just look say like look college basketball he wasn't terribly productive but duke by the end of the year was one of the best teams in college basketball despite losing in the second round uh according to ken palma the fi- final month of the season duke was the sixth best team in the nation and a large portion of that for me was tyrese proctor who if he had not uh, decided to go back to Duke would have been featured in this list. First round, uh, but <laughs> yeah. Oh, I I love Tyrese Proctor. Yep. Um, but Derek Whitehead was the other large reason, in my opinion. He and and lively. So they're freshman trio. But he shot forty three percent from three, nearly eighty percent from the line, seventy nine point three. And defensively, there was times early in the season where I thought his feet were a bit slow. But I thought that later in the season, you could see some of the, the athleticism and heavy footedness start to dissipate. And you'd see him cut off uh, the tacks to cut him off on drives. And offensively, he'd make quick, decisive uh, decisions where he would catch the ball, jab one way, pull up. And he's very smooth. And it's, so he's not just a catch and shoot guy. I think he's got more to his game than catch and shoot. And I think that there's a way that you could play him at one, two, or three, and he could be effective at an NBA level. Yeah, I am so torn on Dariq. I was not the biggest fan coming into the season. I didn't think that he got really good separation. I thought he settled for a lot of contested mid-range pull-ups on, in the high school level because he didn't get get good separation. And then he got hurt. And his role at at Duke, I I believe they limited him. They put him in this role as pretty much a a floor spacer. And the shot looks, it's money. Like, I mean, when he, every shot I saw him shoot, it looked like, you know, it's going in. Especially in a class where you had guys that were projected as shooters and they weren't really efficient shooting. I'm actually surprised that Derek shot a higher percentage from three than Keontae George or Nick Smith or some of the other guys. Now, the degree of difficulty was totally different because he had a lot of spot ups, but he can't shoot off the dribble and he has the size and, and the strength. I mean, I, I think that watching him lately, I think he's a safe pick. I don't know the ceiling. I don't know if he'll, if, if like the athleticism is going to translate, if you know the injury held him back, but I think that he is pretty safe. And I'm at the point now where if he ends up being a top 10 pick, it, it wouldn't surprise me because I was really low on him at one point during the season. And right now I still have him in my 20s, but you know, like I said, I could see if he ends up, ends up going a little bit higher. Yeah, he's someone that I'm not entirely sold on but i do believe given the right system he could really thrive i i it's funny it's an easy parallel but he reminds me of aj griffin from the past year yeah yeah similar roles <clears throat> similar hype coming into the season injuries and aj was money like at one point last year i want to say wasn't he shooting like 48 shoot it yeah, yeah. and uh, yeah so i i could see that all right number so 15. 15. Uh, 15 for me is a guy that may end up higher by the time I'm, it's said and done, but it's Keontae George, who I've had as high as 7th or 8th on my board. I mentioned when I was in Denver, uh, I was very disappointed in his showing, and I don't think it was just Denver. I, I talked about yesterday the importance of not overreacting, both either positively or negatively to bad performances uh, in the case of Brandon Miller and Jerry Walker in terms of their scoring. Deontay George not only did not score, but he he was a negative on the court. Like Baylor was better with Dale Bonner on the floor than Keontae George, and that really bothered me. Uh, he wasn't able to impact the game in a positive direction while on the basketball court on offense or defense, creating for others. Effort seemed to be lacking. Uh, in those two games, he scored 16 total points on th- uh, three of 19 shooting and he was kind of moping about and and that's that bothered me and mannerisms i typically don't read too closely into but being in the third row for one of those games it really it really kind of stood out you can see closely just the efficiency of movements and things and and i wonder i want to say this in case i do move him back up and i watch some other film and i I really like him i wonder if the ankle Mm -hmm. injury he had 
was hampering him, in which case I would say maybe the lack of explosion could be explained because he p- appeared slow to me. Um, and, and that was something that concerned me because his appeal is that he needs the ball and he's going to be Jamal Murray esque if you're going to, if he's going to hit his ceiling. Uh, the floor is that is, you know, he can shoot the ball. The percentages aren't great. We've talked about it. It looks really pretty. It does. I watched him warm up. Uh, but I, I, I don't know what type of impact he has on winning if he's not this awesome score with the ball in his hands, a la a guy like Jamal Murray, who is who I liken him to as a potential uh, high end comparison. And and yeah, just mannerisms and, and lack of burst concern me there. Yeah, I'm I'm torn on Keontae. I was really, really high on him, especially after the performance he had last summer when Baylor oh, was yeah. representing Team USA in, in um a tournament he had in thirty seven and thirty two against Italy and Canada back to back days. Yeah, I mean it was pretty. And I, I have heard some people feel like he signed with Baylor. Not saying he was gonna go to another school, but he signed with Baylor thinking that Adam Flagler wasn't going to be back. And then once they had three kind of smallish guards, in a sense, it kind of made things a little bit, uh, it just kind of made things different because from this is just what I've heard, that he thought he was going to have more, a, a bigger role kind of like on the ball, in a sense. Um, I just don't know how much to factor in the ankle. And I know he released a statement where he said he had so much tape that he never played with that much tape on his ankle. I think that did play a role in his lack of, of burst. The efficiency at the rim was was concerning this year. He was in like the, the low 50s at the rim. I don't know. I, I really don't know what to think. And I, I talked to a scout from one team. I know somebody just kind of kind of tried to call me out on on the comments saying my name is Raphael I talked to a scout Barlow but and I, I mentioned it before but the scout mentioned that they had a a metric and it's probably changed but this was probably back in January where Keontae was like the number one player based off of their their metric and I would love to 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 see what is all put into that but yeah I mean I, I say he was a guy that a lot of people me had in the top six or seven and now I just don't know if he's a lock to be in the lottery. So it's going to be interesting. But let's talk about FanDuel because we are down to the final four and we still have a few weeks left in the NBA season than the playoffs. And there's not a better place to get in the action than FanDuel, which is America's number one sports book. And right now, FanDuel is giving new customers a no sweat first bet up to $1,000. That is up to $1,000 back in bonus bets if your first bet doesn't win. Just go to FanDuel.com slash locked on and sign up today to claim your no sweat first bet. Then you can wager on everything from the money line to the point spreads to which team will be cutting down the net. It's all on the app. It's safe. It's secure and easy to use. So do not miss your shot at a no sweat first bet up to $1,000 when you join FanDuel today. Just go to FanDuel.com slash locked on to sign up. Make every moment more with FanDuel. All right. Who do you have at number 16? I've got Grady Dick, and and this is a guy that in Jazz Twitter, there's a couple fans that if they listen to this, they'll know who they are, that have given me flack for having him outside my lottery each yeah. time. Uh, I, my concern, and maybe this is just the way I perceive it through the lens of being a Jazz fan, and, and I try not to evaluate for any certain team, like whether it's the Jazz, whether it's the number one pick, I try not to think of it that way. But my mindset is if you're in the lottery, you you, you try – unless your team's just beautifully constructed to try to get a guy who can change the course of your, your franchise and, and, and really be the number one or be the supplementary to the guy you've got as number one. And I don't see him as a Batman nor a Robin. And I try to pick those in my lottery. Grady Dick can shoot the ball. No doubt about it. I, t- I said yesterday, or maybe a few days ago that, that Jordan Hawkins, for instance, is a guy I value his type of shooting more than Grady Dick's because he does it off of movement. Uh, I could make a case that Derek Whitehead's equally as good a shooter as Grady Dick, and he's got more upside with the ball in his hands. Yeah. So I, I, I say all this to say he's a fine player, a a good prospect, but I don't see star potential whatsoever. And I I don't think he's that good on defense, but he's a, he's a heady player who's going to shoot the ball well. So if he finds a good fit, he'll be a good player. But I just, 
uh, I can't really move him past 16. And this is a guy that I, I feel pretty confidently. If he moves, it'll be in the negative direction. And it's not even a, a, a negative to him. It's just the way I feel about star power when you're drafting. It's my philosophy uh, where I take the most potential over over a set guy unless the team is beautifully constructed. Yeah, it's very similar because when I put together my mock, I'd have him at a number and then I'd have somebody behind him and I would say, all right, best case scenario, who's going to be better? And then, you know, a player will go up and I will keep moving Grady down. And I don't know if I put him in a box as just a shooter, but I don't, I haven't seen enough flashes of thinking like, okay, maybe he's going to be able to do stuff in ball screens and so on. I just think that he's going to be a really good shooter, but you brought up an excellent point. It's something that I had never thought of. And I'm probably going to ask this question on Twitter and see who's really like paying attention, or is it just something that they're going to go with the first thing that comes to mind, but who is a better shooter, Grady Dick or Derek Whitehead? I think naturally, quickly, you're going to be like Grady Dick. But Derek Whitehead shot a higher percentage. I don't know the volume of attempts off the top of my head, but I know it was a higher percentage. And, I mean, I think there's a real argument there. Uh, I This is controversial. I'll just say it because I've, I've put my hat on the table here before. I don't think Grady Dick's the best shooter in the class. No. I, I I just simply don't, and I've said this before and gotten laughed out of rooms of effectively on Twitter. I would say he's probably closer to the third best shooter than he is the first. I mean that's fair. I, I don't. To me, it's shocking that people would like adamantly disagree because you know you got Hawkins, you have. I mean, you got. There's a case for Jet too because he comes flying for for his lack of speed. Ironically enough, he comes jetting off of pin downs and shoots it. Grady's yep. very much a set shooter, and and I, I value the movement more. Yeah, and, and I'm not the biggest Jet Howard guy because he doesn't rebound or or defend. But oh, if someone neither. told me that they thought Jet was better than Grady Dick, or they asked me why is Grady ahead of Jet, I think I'd have a difficult time really explaining why on, on different mocks. All right, number 17. Who do you have at number 17? Number 17 for me is Derek Lively the second. He's a guy that started the year poorly, had a few injuries, needed to find his role on a Duke team that, that pretty much all needed to find the hierarchy, the pecking order for themselves. He and Tyrese Proctor really uh, worked well together, and I think that helped Lively stock. He's a tremendous defender. That's the appeal. The appeal is that he follows the footsteps of a guy like Walker Kessler or uh, a Jalen Duran, some Mark Williams, one of those type of guys who is a true shot blocker but has the kind of mobility that is – common in this era as opposed to the true shot blockers bigs that were kind of anchors um in the post in the previous eras so he he's a guy that you you hope follows the trajectory of mark williams he's raw he develops more and now you see mark williams score 16 points and 15 rebounds against the mavericks the other night mm -hmm. and uh i think i think lively's got the tools the capacity to be a good player on the offensive side as well i think he's a tremendously underrated passer yeah, he, he really is a good passer. Uh, someone asked me today if the Mavericks end up falling out of the the play-in and they end up keeping their pick, which is top 10 protected, who should they target? And I'm like, lively. I mean, of course, Wimbayama, you know, if, if they get number one. But I think even if they are at like seven or eight or nine or ten, I think you have to go with Derek Lively. He fills so many needs. The Mavericks, are, they're small. You give Luka a rim protector, a shot blocker, and a defender. I think it makes the most sense, especially if they're trying to, or they are trying to win now. So, I mean, they may not be in this. Well, I mean, some people would say, well, you just got to take the best player available. But I think for them, best fit. And he fills so many needs that they have. So, if the Mavericks if the Mavericks miss the playoffs, I would suggest draft Derek Lively if they can keep their their pick if it's in the top ten. All right, number eighteen. Who do you have at eighteen? Number eighteen for me is another G League Ignite guy that I I think I'm higher on than the consensus, and that's Leonard Miller. 
Uh, he's uh, the younger brother of TCU forward Emmanuel Miller, uh, but he's Wait, I bigger. Didn't, I didn't know that. Yeah, I, I, I'm pretty sure at least that makes me worried, but I'm I'm pretty sure I'm right about that. Um, I had no idea. He he's a lefty, uh, who's who's bigger than Emmanuel Miller. Hopefully they're related. I think that they are. Uh, but he's he's only a 29% three-point shooter, but it, defensively and on the glass, that's where he's going to make his money. I think he's, uh, for those of you who haven't watched the G League Night, he reminds me of uh, Noah Clowney, uh, but I think he's further along in his development because he was very raw last year, and I was very low on him, and he's de- tr- uh, improved tremendously in the G League, accepting a role where he's a defensively-oriented guy who plays alongside stars, and play and is a star in his role defensively. Switches, protects the rim, uh, rebounds at an elite level. And recently, he had a a, a twenty rebound game in the G League against oh. grown men as a as a nineteen year old. And oh. I think I, was I think he's going to be really good. I was there. Yeah, I was at that game. And uh, you are right. Emmanuel Miller is his brother. I had no idea. I... You made me worried there. <laughs> yeah, I had I had no idea. Yeah, I like Leonard Miller. Very interesting that he was like the the draft Twitter darling last year, and now people just kind of have fallen off of him, despite the fact that he, in my opinion, has made the biggest improvement over the last 12 months. So I like him. I, I agree. I was very low on him last year, and I'm pretty high on him now. All right, number 19. 19 for me is Bryce Sensabaugh. He's a guy that I've had a trouble kind of placing in this kind of 10, uh, 14 to 20 range. Mm -hmm. He gets to his spots very well, but he also shoots really bad shots, but he can make them. And I've talked about this. If you, if you can make them, I like that. Uh, He's, he's troublesome in my evaluation because I think he should lose weight, but I'm curious if that uh, makes it harder for him to get to his spots because I kind of, he kind of plays some bully ball. Uh, he he's a scoring two guard, and I'm curious to see how high his floor is. I think his ceiling could be pretty high if he's given the right role. Uh, weirdly enough, I, I talked about last year's parallel between Derek Whitehead and AJ Griffin. He reminds me a bit of Malachi Branham, who is the guy who preceded him at Ohio State, and they play an unconventional game where they they rely on kind of the mid range to get their buckets. But he's a guy that was relatively off my radar, quite frankly, to start the year and impress me throughout it. Yeah, I think he could be a riser as far as like his play in the pre-draft process, but I think he's had multiple knee injuries in his high school career, which some feel like it played a role in why he wasn't, you know, a top 20 guy or whatever. So that'd be interesting to see if that, you know, like the the medicals come back to to possibly haunt him. All right, at number 20, it's a guy that I really like. I think I had him at the same number. I didn't have him as high, but number 20. This is this is someone I have been waiting for a very long time. So I use Fanspo for my uh, my big boards, and I've been waiting to put him at 20 for about two months, and he has not been available until this past time. So I was thrilled. <laughs> it's Riley Kugel from Florida. I watched him in December. And I was like, man, this kid's way better than I thought he was. And I I checked my Twitter to make sure of this. In Before the season, someone was, and I apologize for not remembering who tweeted this out. They said, who's a guy that is not a top, top recruit, and he's not going to be a star on his team that you could see getting drafted? And I'd watch Riley Kugel once in AAU, and I was like, man, I, I really like this kid's game. I'm going to kind of keep monitors on him. So I said Riley Kugel, and I wanted to watch him. So I watched Florida play. Castleton runs the show. And then Colin Castleton gets hurt, yep. and Riley Kugel becomes the man. And boy, did he thrive in that. He takes some difficult shots, and that offense was not good even with Colin Castleton, but it was even worse without him. But Riley Kugel has game. He, he can get to the rim. He can slash. He's an underrated athlete. He shoots the ball well, even though he takes some difficult ones. Uh, the ball rotates well out of his hands. I, I think he's you know six foot five. He's a slender build, but I think he's got room to put on muscle. Uh, and he's got a, a kind of a, a game that I think translates very well to the NBA because it's balanced. He's yeah. not overly uh, hucking it from three. He's not overly, I'm going to lower my shoulder with re- reckless abandon and go to the rim. And he can he can score on all three levels. And I think defensively, he'll be adequate as well. Yeah, I want to add one thing. So I received a call this weekend, and it was from 
highly respected evaluator, and he hadn't really been paying attention to college basketball because you know he's doing the NBA. So he asked me my opinion about Riley Kugel, and I told him, and I basically read my notes to him, and then he said, um, "It sounds like Zach Levine." When you when you read like you know you when you go by the at least my notes and he said well the person that talked to me that told me I need to pay attention to him said the same thing you're saying and he was like it sounds like Zach Levine and he asked me why isn't he considered higher or getting a lot of first round buzz if these characteristics are very similar to the things that he said about Zach Levine and I mentioned he's kind of a late bloomer in a sense but the question I want to ask you is how crazy does Mississippi State look by firing the coach when they would have had him on their team? Yeah, I I will say this. Chris Jans did a good job at Mississippi State, but but to your point, that is a, that is a miss because <laughs> he's very talented. Uh, one, one thought about the difference between he and Levine. Levine is one of the best open court athletes, Yeah, but I might argue that Kugel and, and granted, I was young when, when Zach Levine came out of UCLA. I believe I was 13. Uh, but what I recall is that Zach Levine was a tremendous athlete in the open court, but didn't really have the strength to finish. Mm-hmm. And I think Kugel's not super strong, but he's craftier than Levine was at finishing at, at this kind of stage. And I think he doesn't quite have that same explosiveness, but he's got more guile around the hoop, both in terms of like mid-range, finding a floater and, and just kind of like jackknifing up reverse layups. And so I, I, I'm not going to say he's a better uh, re, a prospect than Levine, but I, I think they're a little different. He's got a more nuanced approach to scoring. Levine's more, more reliant on his athleticism. Once again, thank you, the listener, for making the Locked On NBA Big Board podcast your first listen of the day. Now, for your second listen, you got to check out the Game to Game NBA podcast. Every moment, every top performance, every results, Locked On, every result. Locked on Game to Game covers every game from across the NBA with local analysis that only we can deliver. So follow Game to Game on the Locked on NBA channel. Available on the Odyssey app, YouTube, or wherever you get your podcast. Once again, it's Rafael Barlow, Leaf Tulane, and we are out. Yeah,